settings based on the life of Abraham. And then we're going to tie it up, God willing. We can do this in 55 minutes, the Lord being my helper. Let's go to John chapter number 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Please say that. That's how everything starts. It starts with the seed. It starts in the beginning. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same. They were synchronized. There was continuity. Verse 14. And what was in the beginning with God became flesh. And what was in the beginning with God became flesh. That beginning is a relative beginning. And dwelt among us. In other words, there was manifestation. And we beheld the glory as of the only begotten Father, full with grace and with truth. Let's go now to Luke 24 verse 45. Luke 24 verse 45. Then he opened the understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's an astounding verse. Because these are individuals that had been with him for over three and a half years. And yet they were blinded in some way. He opened their understanding. If it is possible, put your hands on your head and say, Open my understanding. To understand my rhema. Now, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter number 7, starting from verse 1, the message version. Fairly lengthy, please bear with us. During the time Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, was King Judah, king of Rezin, of Aram, the king of Pekah, son of Remilia, of Israel. They attacked Jerusalem. But the attack sputtered out. Say that. When the Davidic government learned that Aram had joined forces with Ephraim, that is Israel, Ahaz and his people were badly shaken. They shook like trees in the wind. You will not be shaken. I said you will not be shaken. Then God told Isaiah, go meet Ahaz, take your son Shajashub, which means a remnant will return with you. Meet him south of the city at the end of the aqueduct where it empties out into the upper pool on the road to the public laundry. The King James Version says the fuller's place. Tell him, tell him, tell him, listen, calm down. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Say that. Say, calm down. Just tell that person next to you. Tell that person next to you. Tell them, say, calm down. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Over these two burnt out cases. They're just burnt out cases. Resin of Aram and the son of Remilia. They talk big. <laughs> but there's nothing to them. Ooh. They talk big, but there's nothing to them. The reason for that, their speech is not based on faith. Aram, along with Ephraim, son of Remilia, have plotted to do you harm. They've conspired against you, saying, let's go to war against Judah, dismember it, take it for ourselves, and set up a son of Tabil as a puppet vassal king over it. But God, the master says, it won't happen. Shout, it won't happen. Nothing will come of it because the capital of Aram is Damascus. The king of Damascus is a mere man, Razin. As for Ephraim, 65 years from now, Ephraim will be rubble. Nothing will be left of it. You panicking about an enemy that has no future. That devil that's giving you trouble next year, this time, won't even be in existence. Give somebody a high five. Say, don't panic. God says, I got this. I got this. 
<laughs> this is a place where a bull Winston laugh. I wish I could. <laughs> I've been practicing, man. I just can't get it right. Amen. You better put a copyright on that dog. Amen. Watch this. If you don't take a stand in faith, you won't have a leg to stand on. If you don't take a stand in faith, throw it up, stay, throw it up. If you don't take a stand in faith, you won't have a leg to stand on. Verse 10 and 11, God spoke again to Ahaz. This time he said, ask for a sign from your God. Watch this, ask anything. Be running already ask for a sign shout ask anything but don't just ask anything shout be extravagant because God is in a generous mood even if you ask for the moon God says I'm going to give it to you if you ask, he said, tonight it's going to open. Even if you ask me for the moon, the moon is on the table tonight. Oh, it's on the table tonight. It's on the table tonight. You're going to pray a prayer you've never prayed before. Your rhema is about to jump out of you and ah, something you've been believing for is going to hit in this room. I need about 300 people to give God some praise up in here. Verse 12. Verse 12. Don't mess with the microphone. Verse 12. But A.S. said, I'd never, I'd never do that. God gives him a blank check. He said, I'd never do that. I'd never make demands like that on God. So Isaiah told him, then listen to this government of David. It's bad enough that you make the people tired with your pious, timid hypocrisies. But now you're making God tired also. I should just close the book right there. Listen to this, God says. I, irrespective of this, I'm going to give you a sign. He says, I'm going to give you a sign that's way in the future. And the sign is going to be, watch this, he says, a girl who is presently a virgin will get pregnant. He doesn't say a girl in the future will get pregnant. He said a girl a girl, oh Jesus, help me. A girl who is presently a virgin. Sisters and brothers, this is a, a millennium away. A millennium away. And God has her right there. He says, a girl who is presently a virgin will get pregnant. She'll bear a son and his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. And, and by the time this child is 12 years old, able to make, and it goes on and on. In other words, God is giving you a sign that's in the future, but it's now. What, what you are anticipating for the future is now. Amen. For a few minutes this evening, I'm going to preach to you on the subject. When Rhema meets Rhema. When Rhema meets Rhema. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessing here tonight. Sisters and brothers, anointing comes in levels. Anointing is, an, is, is something that's somehow a little difficult to understand and to comprehend. Uh, because... Uh, it's, it's God's enabling power. In this service, you, you could feel the anointing rise and swell and ebb. And, and, and uh, when, when Wilt and his team were singing, who did a phenomenal job, you could feel that anointing just pushing, pushing the limit, just pushing it, pushing it. Because there, there are no limits to the anointing, and yet there are times when the anointing is very thin. And so this week, they are going to be extraordinary, extraordinary breakthroughs and testimonies. There will be an anointing to heal. There will be an anointing in the service to prophesy. 
There's going to be an anointing to be delivered. There's going to be anointing to, to, to preach. There's going to be an anointing to, to, there's even an anointing to receive from God. Because some things are very difficult to receive outside of the anointing. Some things are just, even though it's, it's being spoken like it is here in the scripture, you need to be anointed to receive. So put your hands on your head and say, anoint me to receive. Yes, enlarge my capacity. Anoint me to receive. Anoint me to receive something that's a hundred years from now. Not even for me, but for my grandchildren. Because if I can possess it now and get the deed for it now, my grandchildren, when the enemy comes in like a flood, what I possess now, oh, what I hold in my hand now, will protect my children in the future. That's why it's important to obey the anointing. Because in the anointing, God gives you an opportunity to possess a title deed that your family holds for the future that's why that mess going on in the Middle East with Israel they won't be able to take that land because Abraham possessed the title deed so when that case goes to heaven and God judges the case he says okay there might be injustice there might be all those kinds of things who's got the title deed go back in the record Abraham still has the deed so no matter what the United Nations does, no matter what the nations do, they won't get that piece of dirt because 4,000 years before, Abraham got the deed in the anointing. So tonight you got to catch it. you got to grab the deed for healing, for blessing, for breakthrough, for anointing, for prosperity. You might not have money now, but possess the deed for prosperity for your grandchildren. Anoint me to receive. Anoint me to receive. Let's look at the 12 laws of breakthrough. For this we want to go to the book of Acts chapter number 3. It's a quick, quick spin. The 12 laws of breakthrough in Acts chapter number 3. You've got to work me quickly and you'll have to get the CD. Acts chapter number 3 and you'll see why because I don't have time to spend on this. I have to be disciplined especially here. Acts chapter number 3 verse 1, King James Version. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple. Went up together. That's the law of agreement. Number one, the law of agreement. At the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. The ninth hour. Number two, the law of timing. A certain man laying from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily. Whom they laid daily. The law of routine. At the gate of the temple which is called beautiful. Number four, the law of excellence. To ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who seeing Peter and John go into the temple. Go into the temple. The law of access. Uh, uh, asked alms. Verse four. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said. Look on us. Look on us. The law of focus. And he gave heed to receive. He gave heed unto them expecting to receive something from them. Expecting to receive something from them. That's the law of expectation. The law of expectation. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. Such as I have, give I thee. The law of content. The law of content. You can't give what you don't got. Verse 7, and he took him by the right hand, took him by the right hand and lifted him and lifted him. That's the law of support, the law of support. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Walking, leaping, praising God. The law of progress, progress. Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and leaping. All the people saw him, the law of visibility. Verse number 10, and they knew that this was the man who was begging for arms at the gate beautiful of the temple. And they were all, all of them were filled with wonder and amazement. Filled with wonder and amazement. Law number 12, the law of awe, the law of awe. 12 laws of breakthrough, the law of agreement. God's about to give somebody into your life that's going to agree with you. Because if two of you shall 
touch something in this dimension, anything is going to be done. Tell somebody, agree with me. Amen. Number two, the law of timing. It's taken all of history to get to this moment, to get to this conference, to get to this Sunday night. For somebody, it's in the law of timing. It's going to explode in your spirit. The law of routine, the things you have been doing, Dr. Pat, over and over and over and over and over. And it doesn't make any logical sense as to why you keep on doing the same thing when God has told you to do it. That routine is about to cross a line where the routine comes into actuality. The law of excellence, because you're doing things on a high level, God knows he can trust you. The law of focus, you're, you're focusing, you're pressing, forgetting those things that are behind but you're pressing forward into the murky unknown you know that something is coming but you don't know what it is and you keep on pushing forward tell someone keep on pushing number six the law of expectation the law of expectation sisters and brothers you get what you expect you get what you expect Dr. Winston somebody was criticizing me a year and a half ago on the car I drive they were just hating on me on the car I drive. And so I just turned to them, I said, why are you hating on me? I said, this is my expectation come to pass. So instead of hating on me, raise your expectation. Oh, hate on me because the brother had an expectation. You get your own expectation. I do expect a jet, so don't hate. You expect a triple seven if that's in your spirit. Raise your expectation. Baby, if you expect nothing, it's the law of expectation. You get jack. Let's deal with a brief definition of the word rhema. This is going to take me maybe 12 minutes. It's going to be a little rudimentary. It's going to be a little bit, a bit of a loud because sometimes people don't want to think too much. But let's just... De deal with this. Logos and Kronos, which is the unfolding of time, work together. And it is Rhema and Kairos. Rhema, which is the manifestation of the word, and Kairos, where a heavenly occurrence takes place. It's just like God says, I like that place, cuts a hole and drops something in, and a Kairos moment takes place. So Rhema and Kairos, which we'll experience both before the service is over, Rhema and Kairos work together. Logos and Kronos work together. So you start over here and it takes you 40 years walking in time to walk out what God has put in your spirit. But every now and then God just cuts a hole in your family and drops the Rhema and also explodes a Kairos moment. Our goal is to touch a Kairos moment here as the Rhema manifests in your life. The word rhema, the, the, uh, the etymological structure of the word rhema, the, the Bible cannot claim rights to the word logos or rhema. The word logos or rhema, logos as you know means the thought, idea, the concept, the plan, the blueprint. It means there's a thinker behind the thought, the architect and the planner. It's one who is an establishmentarian, one who has an idea or a concept in their head and they then express that idea, maybe on paper or maybe through verbiage, through a word spoken. So the word Logos first began to manifest uh, around about uh, the 700th century uh, AD, around a, a, a group of individuals that were Greeks. The first one, notably, to use the concept of the word Logos was Plato. And uh, of course, in that era, there was a rich uh, something, something that hit the Greek peninsula, which includes Macedonia, Sparta, the Athenians, some heavenly portal set on that region. And, and men, to me, the greatest uh, uh, of all time, to me, and, and they are greats, is Archimedes. Because the things that Archimedes gave the world are... Uh, 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 Phenomenal, without schools, with, without apparatus, without tools, 
without books, without literal education, Archimedes comes up and he invents the lever and the pulley. He says, give me a lever and a place to stand and I'll move the world. And he did with these mathematical formulas. But in that same rich era, Plato comes up with the word logos. Because they'd been analyzing the Babylonian civilization and, and they'd been interrogating the Medes and the Persian uh, uh, civilization which seemed to have uh, some sort of progressive trend. And here was a small little state, a small group of people, tribes, uh, united by a single language, uh, all of them within their own right, powerful and strong, but, but, but not corporately functional because they were extremely tribal and territorial. Uh, they, they corporately began to believe that even as a small group of people, we as the Greeks, can make a contribution to the world that can change the world, not just now, but forever. And, and they came up with the idea of logos, which was a word, a simple word, an idea, a concept, some belief that had no uh, uh, foundational place to stand. The illegitism, illegitimacy of that idea was, was horrific to think that a handful of cave dwelling people uh, that had no engineering, had no structure, uh, had no philosophical basis, a handful of people could actually uh, diabolically, in my own words, conceive such an idea that we can rule the world from this small little vassal place. Uh, a, a heinous idea that a handful of insignificant people could dare to believe that the ideas and concepts could shape time and shape people and shape generations. And so one of Plato's students then became Socrates, who's fascinating in his own way. And, and Socrates began in uh, the Athenian circles. He began two schools. He began a day school. The day school was what he called the Rhema school. The day school was the Rhema school, where he began to lay out the plans and the ideas uh, of how you can implement these lofty thoughts and concepts. The night school was for those that were passers-by, a mere hors d'oeuvre to what was being offered in the night schools, uh, day schools. And so it was open to everybody with no fees. Uh, he charged fees in the day because he had this idea that if you give people something for nothing, they'll never appreciate it. So you got to let them pay in the day. We'll give them a taster in the evening. We'll whet their appetite. We'll give them a mere hors d'oeuvre. But then when the appetite is whetted and when the hors d'oeuvre has been served, we'll then offer them the entree in the day. But they're going to have to pay for it. If they don't have money, they'll work it out and we'll give them wages attributed to the level of work they had. They developed a meritorian society, a society that had to earn what was theirs. It was a meritocracy in its conception. And so these incredible men began to teach. And of course, one of Socrates' uh, students who was very bright, had a very high IQ, almost 185, his intellectual quotient was 185, that's uh, Aristotle. Bright young man, extremely brilliant, a little cocky, uh, a little bit uh, uh, arrogant and, and away, in a way, uh, starts working in that school. And so now with Aristotle joining the school, what was a logos uh, 50 years before, is starting to show the assimilation of a rhema, the shaping of a manifestation of an idea, because suddenly, the school began to attract the creme de la creme. They began to bring in the kinds of minds that they believed they could build this idea on. And then, unfortunately, Aristotle commits suicide, uh, and that's a long story. Uh, uh, rather, Socrates commits suicide, and Aristotle goes into a self-imposed uh, 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 exile. In his solitary confinement, which lasted just over 12 years, where he was uh, uh, still musing over the possibilities of his mentor tutor being alive and the kinds of things they could have done. King Philip, who had built up a formidable army at the time, King Philip sent for him and brought him out of exile. And King Philip asked him to teach and mentor his son. His son was a little boy between nine and ten. His name was Alexander. And so here you have Aristotle who makes one commitment. He says, I will teach your boy provided he does everything I tell him. And provided he's willing to work in experimentation for the things I put in him. 
And so here Aristotle enters into the room with a logos, a thought, an idea that this little sapling, this little uh, royal uh, arrogant little thing can be shaped into a world leader. And so now Aristotle has an opportunity not just to teach and mentor someone, he has an opportunity to shape somebody and show that what his granddaddy in philosophy believed can now come to pass. All he needed was one person. All he needed was one client. All he needed was one person that had the capacity, the competence, the capability just to believe. Tell the person next to you, say, I'm that one person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All God has been looking for is that one person, that one preacher, that one business person, that one musician, the one singer, the one person from Malawi, the one person from South Africa, the one person from Zimbabwe who's been living in a hell hole. But watch this. When, when God finds the one person, as Aristotle did, he spends 12 years, 12 years, 12 years shaping this boy, putting discipline in his life. Teaching him not archaic ideas or primitive primatological structures. He's teaching him the future. He's showing him the possibilities. He's opening doors of what can be for the Grecian people. He said, you are Alexander, you're great, but Greece is greater. You are Alexander, you are gifted, but Greece is greater. Think Greece. Think future. And he put in Alexander the ideas of what we enjoy today. Things like democracy. And of course the ideals of thoughts and, and schools and thinking and the rest is history. So, so that word, Rhema then, in Alexander's life at the age of 20 when he becomes uh, the king of, of Macedonia and then all of the united Greece. In a few years he becomes the emperor of the Grecian empire. And what was the law was a hundred years before is now a rhema because the Greek language went around the world. Jesus spoke Greek. The Bible was written in Greece. Some of the greatest uh, 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 individuals in the book of Acts came from the, the, the schools that the Greeks developed in Alexandria and Athens. And so, so what was an idea is now in, in total structure functional even today almost 3,000 years later. Because it is possible for an idea or a thought or a concept, a logos to become a rhema. Someone say, I have a rhema. Come on, say it like you had something to eat. I have a rhema in my spirit. The word rhema is first introduced, sisters and brothers, into the scripture. It's first introduced into the scripture in John chapter number one and verse one. In the beginning was the word, logos. The word was made flesh, logos. Uh, rather, the word was made flesh, verse 14, rhema, and dwelt among us. So the word logos then was imported from the Greek culture and the Greek idea and concept. And John is the only one that uses this word uh, uh, in terms of rhema. The, the gospel of John, which is an interesting gospel, the gospel of John was the last Bible book to be written in the 66. The gospel of John was the last one to be written. It was written in the year 97 AD, which is rather fascinating. The first gospel and the first writing, record Christian writing to the church is in Acts chapter number 15, where they sent letters to all the churches. We don't have a record of those letters or those epistles to all the churches. And we know that the apostle Paul was part and parcel of the, of the drafting of that document uh, 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 to, to, to the church. But the first notable gospel, and I hope Life of Christ hits me here, uh, Life of Christ 1, was the gospel of Mark to the Romans. Then comes Matthew uh, to, to the Jews, and then comes uh, 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 Luke to the Greeks, or initially to Theophilus, and the, the gospel of John. But where it's placed uh, uh, fourth, we seem to think that he was the fourth book written, it wasn't. What happened was, the scripture says, that when Jesus was dying on the cross, he spoke seven times. One of the things he said in those seven times he spoke, Jesus said to John, he said, this is your mother. And he said to his mother Mary, this is your son. And then John says, from that day, Jesus, uh, Mary went home to live with John. And so, so uh, 
John, you don't see too much of John in, in the book of Acts. It's a lot of Paul, but you don't see too much of John. You see him uh, uh, in chapter number three of Acts, and then the next time you see him is on a, a, a mandated call to the city of Samaria. But then you don't hear of John, and the reason for that, he's looking after Mary. He's looking after uh, his new mother, and, and he's, 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 he's uh, taking care of her. And historically, it's said that Mary died in the year 69 AD, a year before the invasion of the city of Jerusalem by Titus the general. And it appears that the Lord Jesus would not allow his mother to go to that horrible, heinous act in Jerusalem where so many were brutalized. So it appears that she dies just before, sisters and brothers, the, the storming of Jerusalem. Watch this. So for 40 years, John is living with Mary. And in John chapter 25, John says this, 24. He says, if I could tell you all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. He said, I suppose the world itself could, could not contain these words. So, so how, how could John say that? Because for 40 years, 40 years, Mary was telling him the visitation of the angel Gabriel. Her pregnancy, the first time the baby kicked, her, her pains when the baby was born, how they lived in Egypt, his first few steps, the few words he spoke out of his spirit. For 40 years, she's telling him every day about Jesus. 40 years, Jesus. 40 years, John hasn't written a book. He hasn't written anything. 40 years. And when Mary dies in 70 AD, John goes to the city of Ephesus and there his apostolic grace hits the city of Ephesus with such power and force that he becomes a threat to the Roman Empire. He then is taken by Emperor Domitian and sent to the Isle of Patmos where he spends 12 years on the Isle of Patmos. 12 years later, 12 years later in the 12th year, John gets the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the first book he writes, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Adding to what he already had been had, pounded in his spirit for 40 years with Mary. Then he writes 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And then he is released from Patmos by King, uh, Emperor Vernon. And John goes to Ephesus and now in 97 AD, after being in ministry for almost 80 years, 80 years, after being in ministry for 80 years, he has access to all the Pauline epistles, access to all the gospels, he has access to the epistle of Peter, Jude, James, he has access to all of that. And of all the things John could have said, of all the things, the ways he could have began his gospel, he starts it with, in the beginning was the word let me encourage somebody it might be spinning in your spirit for 70 years but if the word was in the beginning in your spirit your responsibility is don't die don't get crazy don't lose your mind don't start taking drugs stay on the road because what was a rhema what was a lowest brother ray is about to be a rhema in your word you never know what might happen tomorrow morning faith might explode in your spirit so let's break this down just a little more in terms of the word rhema the word rhema let's do a little scripture study now very briefly uh, and, and, and show you possibly why Abraham had faith let's go to John chapter number 8 and verse 52 John 8 52 I'm trying. <laughs> John 8, 52. Then said the Jews unto Jesus, Now we know you've got a devil. He said, Abraham is dead, and the prophets are dead, and you say, if a man keep uh, my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets which are dead? And, and, and whom makest you yourself? Verse 56. Verse 56. Your father Abraham. Notice he doesn't say our father Abraham. He says your father Abraham. Because I got a different father. 
your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it he rejoiced to see my day and he saw it <laughs> and was glad then said the Jews unto him you are not even 50 years old and, and you, you said uh, you have seen Abraham and Jesus said, Verily, verily, Zviro Quazo, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So, so where where did Abraham see Jesus? Let's go now to Genesis chapter number 15, verse 1. Genesis 15 verse 1. This is not a hypothetical statement that Jesus makes. This is Abraham actually meeting Jesus. Genesis 15 verse 1. Look at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. It's not the word came to him. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. It wasn't a word. It was the word of the Lord that came to Abraham in a vision. What happened after God cut, cut covenant with Abraham? The word of the Lord, who's the word? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. That word was made flesh. So now that Abraham is being positioned for great things, the word of the Lord, that's Jesus, stepped into Abraham, stepped right into Abraham's dream and says, I'm the one that you've been waiting for and looking for. I'm gonna take you to the future because what you have to go through now is highly dependent on what you're seeing here. So Abraham saw his day. Now watch what the word of the Lord said. Watch what the word of the Lord said. Watch what the word of the Lord said. The word of the, this is not, this is not a word that God is giving. It's an actual manifestation of Jesus. Watch what he says. He says, fear not Abraham. I am your shield. An exceeding great reward. Of all the things that he could have said. Of all the things he could have said. Why did he say I am your shield? He could have said I am your provider. I am your healer. Because he, uh, Sarah was struggling. He could have said I am your way maker. Uh, he could have said oh he says I am your shield. Why did he say that? The reason for that is because there was an angel guarding the tree of life. The angel guarding the place of Eden. And the sword required that anybody enter in there had to be the word of the Lord. Had to be God's original mandate. So when he says, I am your shield. In other words, I'm going to take you back to God's plan. But there's a sword that will take you out. I have to keep you from that sword. Oh, Jesus, help me preach to somebody here. God is about to bring a protection on someone's life and a blessing on your life because the way you're about to take seems to be hard but the word of the Lord is coming to you and he's going to be a shield thou O Lord are a shield about me you are the lifter of my soul God's about to give you divine protection clap your hands and give God a praise right there when Abraham saw that the Bible says he was glad the reason some people are struggling here, you haven't had that thing manifest in your life yet. So the struggle is painful. The struggle is difficult. But what's about to happen in the next few days? He's going to come to you in a vision. And what you have believed, the rhema out there, is about to kick the rhema in here. Rhema is about to meet rhema. Bishop in my my goodness. You have to believe, you have to believe that the rhema inside of you is about to be confronted with the rhema that's in the future. Because at some point when God gives you a word that doesn't even make sense and there's no one else around you that can attest to that word, that can stand with that word, you're going to need Jesus to step right into your dream. In your lowest moment and in your lowest and darkest point, 
where you believe that millions were coming and your check for ten dollars just bounced they won't even sell you gasoline because your, your credit card is saying we don't know who this person is but tonight God's about to step the word of the Lord is about to come in and talk to the rhema that's been so isolated in your spirit ah, and rhema is about to meet rhema in your life and what was impossible with man with God all things all things all things all things we're in the balcony all things you couldn't even afford to be in this meeting but you're here because the rhema in your spirit is about to meet rhema faith for the supernatural is about to hit your spirit Let's go now and read chapter number 14. No, no, no. Chapter number 9 of Matthew. Matthew 9. I'm good. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 19. And Jesus arose and followed him. That's Jairus. Verse number 20. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood for 12 years came behind him. And she what? She touched the hem of his garment for she said what? She said within herself. There's a rhema. There's a rhema. She said within herself. Because sometimes you can't pray too loud. Because the person next to you will think you crazy. It's like how are you in Malawi going to believe God for a jet? And, and a, a, a 25,000 seater. How are you going to believe that? So, so you say it in yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. But she touched a rhema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She touched the rhema. When rhema hit rhema, it exploded in her life. Now watch. Let's go now to Matthew 14. 14. Because your rhema, your experience is important. The reason your experience is important is for verse number 35. Matthew 14 verse 35. And when the men, not the women, when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent it all about the country and they brought all those that were diseased. Verse 36. And besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. The men of that place heard about a woman who got a breakthrough a year before. And when the men heard that, they said, if this girl, a woman who was outside for 12 years, if she could touch the hem of his garment and behold, if we can just, if one person got a breakthrough through Rhema, we're going to bring everybody in the room that's why you got to get a breakthrough tonight. That's why you got to go in tonight. That's why you got to break forth tonight. It's not even about you. It's about those people that for decades and generations have suffered with sickness and disease. When they see your faith, they'll touch his garments. And as many as touched him. Tell someone you got to break through tonight. Oh, come help me. Let's go to Psalm chapter number 2, verse 7, message version. Psalm 2, verse 7, message version. Let me tell you what God said next. He said, you are my son. Today is your birthday. <laughs> Tell somebody happy birthday. You are my son. Today is your birthday. What do you want? Name it. Nations as a present. Continents as a prize. You can command them all into dance for you. And stuff that you don't want, you can throw into tomorrow's trash. The devil is a liar. And so is his mother-in-law. My rhema is kicking tonight. 
Devil, it's my birthday this day. Have I been begotten? And God gave me a promise that tonight, if I ask him for anything, it shall. So open up your mouth and ask him. Don't be afraid. Shout hallelujah. Shout amen. We need a revelation and a revolution like that in the body of Christ. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, it's shot. This is the embassy of the kingdom of God. Start reading from Numbers chapter number uh, 11. Numbers chapter number 11. And I'm going to start reading from verse 14. While you're going there, let me just uh, preempt this reading by stating that uh, Numbers chapter 13 and 14 are the chapters in which the children of Israel are going to take their inheritance, their first opportunity to do so. And so there are a number of things that have to be in place, components that are essential for us to be in place before we possess our inheritance. Chapter number 11, verse 14 of the book of Numbers. Moses is speaking. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me if you will deal thus with me kill me I pray you out of your hand if I have found favor in your sight let me not see my wretchedness another word for wretchedness there is incompetence let me not see my incompetence if I have found favor in your sight don't allow me to see my incompetence and the Lord said to Moses Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take the spirit which is upon you, and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear this burden of the people with you, and you will not bear it up yourself alone. And say unto the people in verse 18, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for tomorrow you shall eat flesh. Everybody say, tomorrow this time. time. You shall not eat flesh for one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor even twenty days, but a whole month. Until the flesh comes out of your nostrils, it shall be loathsome unto you. Verse 21, And Moses said, The people among us are six hundred thousand footmen. And you have said, I will give them flesh to eat for a whole month. Shall the flocks uh, and the herds be slain for them to satisfy this? Or shall we empty the sea of fish to satisfy them? And the Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? You will see now whether my words will come to pass or not. Father, thank you for your blessing. Please help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I began yesterday, if as far as I can remember, introducing the subject, building a king. And it is extremely important that we understand that the kingdom of God is a process. When Jesus came and taught his disciples, he spent three and a half years with these men and trained them. They were actually being trained in their degree program in the kingdom. And at their graduation celebration, uh, as he was being translated and ascended into heaven, he told them to go and build the kingdom. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 1 and verse 1, concerning the kingdom, he said to his apostles, which was important, Luke introduces his book by saying to Theophilus, I am telling you what Jesus began both to do and teach. And then he says, uh, in that book, he says, it is important that you understand, Theophilus, that the kingdom of God is an entity that is going to be restored at some point. 
So the kingdom of God then is a process, something that we walk into. The kingdom of God is a conglomeration of journeys. Our lives comprise of many journeys which culminate in the summation of an ultimate journey. And so when we begin to deal with building a king, we don't see this any better, in my opinion, than in the life of King Saul, who was the most eligible person in terms of his uh, spiritual DNA, because he was a Benjamite, but he was also extremely ineligible, because he was totally uh, incompetent as an individual. And so as I mentioned yesterday, to recap, I mentioned that Saul was disadvantaged in so many aspects of his life. He was disadvantaged socially because he was not part of the higher echelon of uh, Jewish society. He was disadvantaged because he had never participated in spiritual things. If you read the scripture in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel, the scripture says that when he looked for the sea of Samuel, when he came to the city, he was talking to Samuel. And he asked Samuel the question, is there a seer in the city? And what, that's an amazing scripture to me because he was speaking to Samuel, at least he should have recognized the man of God. Samuel had long dreads. He was a Nazarite. He'd never cut his hair from, from when he was born. Stand up, my brother. <laughs> Samuel's dreads were longer than those. And so that should have been a hint that he should have recognized. But Saul was so out of tune with the social, political, and even spiritual dimensions in the city, he couldn't recognize Samuel. I mean, Samuel, he should have recognized Samuel. And the deal with Samuel is that Samuel was the prophetic voice in Israel. He was raised miraculously from the womb of his mother Hannah, who was barren, in the house of Eli, where he was subjected to uh, an opportunity to serve. At the age of nine, God visits this young child and gives him a program he gives him the vision he gives him the mandate for Israel socially economically politically and spiritually but Samuel who was not mentored correctly by Eli neither was he mentored by his own father Elkaniah Samuel is raised with a prophetic voice that makes a major contribution to the Jewish community as a people who are being suppressed incidentally by all the ites in the region and the Philistines and even though Samuel's prophetic position and his word was so significant Israel needed to go a step further. They needed to move from a prophetic position to a position of kingship. It's not enough that we have a prophetic voice. The prophetic voice is important. But the prophetic voice doesn't enter or doesn't allow us to enter into the total essence of what God wants us to be. It's not enough that we go to church on Sundays. It's not enough that we participate in spiritual activity. It has to go to the next level where we are directed by kings or men that have a mandate from God and women that can bring us to a place where we can amend, alter, adjust the environments, societies, tribes, nations, ethnic groups in which we find ourselves living in. And so our challenge then as churchmen from an African perspective and I know for those that are here as leaders, our challenge then is moving people from one place to another trying to coerce people and come up with the kinds of programs to move people from one place to another is always a challenge and if we can begin to get the kinds of materials together training manuals uh, regimented manuals where we can move people from point A to point B and evaluate how these people have been trained and evaluated then within a short period of time we will have amended the problems in her book uh, serving humanity the mother of the New Age movement by the name of Alice Bailey. These are very hard books to get, but you can find it. Serving Humanity. Alice Bailey gave 10 particular points. And in these 10 points, she states that a nation and a, a people and a society can be changed. And they can be moved in a certain way where what we teach them over a period of 40 years, if those people grasp the ideas these 10 ideas, then you will have controlled society and keep them in that kind of a way for a minimum of 100 years. Now here's the point. If we teach this generation, starting from our children, all the way up, teaching them certain kingdom dynamics, and they grasp these dynamics, it will take 100 years to alter what's been trained in those kids. So, so we have to now target our children so when we start talking about building a king and start constructing the, the teaching materials 
It's not just imparting academic knowledge or information that is important, but there has to be a kingdom belief system. I have discovered that many, many Christians sitting in churches today don't even know what are the fundamental basic teachings of a church, of the church, what we believe. Saul is then given a number of signs. The signs Saul is given, and these are important because we'll see this in the life of Moses in my summation of yesterday. The signs that Saul is given is that firstly, when we are building a kingship era of leaders that walk in kingship, there has to be a recognition of prophetic gifts. In other words, the impartation of the God factor in our lives. What has God imparted me to do? Ministry is not just standing on a Sunday holding a microphone. Ministry is everything else you do. I was so fascinated seeing a police officer come down the aisle, put her offering here, and I, my brain was saying to me, she's wearing a gun in church. <laughs> but that's a ministry. Our sister has a ministry. She's serving the community, serving Atlanta, serving the state of Georgia, I'm sure, and this country. It's a ministry. Being a great mother is a ministry, and so on and so forth. But we have to recognize that the gifts that God has given to us, we must maximize those gifts. Saul also had to recognize that he needed to learn how to interact with higher levels of leadership. Because being in kingship, there's some point in your life where God's going to bring you into the presence of people who have greater ability and qualifications that, that, than we do. And when you come into the presence of such highly qualified people, you have to, uh, of necessity, interact with these individuals where you do not feel inferior and you do not feel that their gift is making you feel small but you have to recognize that this is a moment of opportunity because every person in this room no matter who you are you are inferior to me in some way or another but at the same token every person in this room you are superior to me in one way or another so when God brings us into the lives of individuals it's a divine opportunity for us to be elevated and we have to recognize this it's imperative that we recognize this as to where we're going understanding our anointing and the things that God has done in our lives is extremely important we ended yesterday by talking about Rachel the sepulchre of Rachel the place of favor someone say favor. favor when you are 